I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. I recently found a podcast. Honestly, this is one of the best resources out there because knowledge is power when it comes to money. So you need resources to help you make money, grow money, and keep money. This podcast helps you navigate in investing, retirement, debt, savings, basically everything you need to know about personal finance. And it does it in a really quick way. Each episode is about 20 minutes or less. But anyway, the podcast that I'm talking about is called DIY Money. Do-it-yourself money, DIY money. These guys take a fun, it's, it's a real playful and entertaining approach to every all things money. And they know what they're talking about. I've known these guys for a decade. They're experts at what they do. This is what they do. They, and, and they love it. DIY Money takes listener questions on topics ranging from budgeting, tracking expenses, investing, retirement plans. And again, they cover making it, keeping it, growing it. And they do it also without putting you to sleep because some of those topics, budgeting, I can't stand listening to, but they make it fun. So do yourself a favor, check out the DIY Money Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Listen to DIY Money. Check out the DIY Money Podcast. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. I am always fascinated by entrepreneurship. I study entrepreneurship. I think about it a lot. I've been an entrepreneur on and off since 1990. My first business, actually, I started in 19. 87. It was a debit card for college students. My first successful business was in the mid 90s. And I just keep telling myself I'm never going to do it again. And then I always do it again. That's why I was so excited to be able to interview one of the most popular podcasters out there, Guy Raz. His podcast is called How I Built This. And he's interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs. And he takes all the lessons he learned and he really divides it up in such a smart way in his book, How I Built This. How do you get the idea? How do you handle risk? How do you handle resilience? How do you pivot? How do you know when to quit? How do you know when to raise money? How do you know when to bootstrap? So many things. And so we talked about these lessons and more and, and all the stories involved or many of the stories involved on the podcast that you're about to listen to. But I do also recommend if you're an entrepreneur or know someone who is, buy this book, How I Built This, listen to his podcast, but also I found many of these techniques useful if you're a writer, if you're an entertainer, if you're a creative of any type. So anyway, you'll see why I think this because we talk about all of it in the podcast you're about to listen to.
How I Built This by Guy Raz. Uh, How I Built This is an amazing podcast, very popular, tens of millions of downloads uh, a month. Uh, Guy Raz has been with NPR, and then you're a a war correspondent. You went from being a war correspondent to being one of the most popular podcasters in the world with, with How I Built This and your other podcasts. How I Built This is about entrepreneurship. But Guy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, James. Appreciate it. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned how I built this is now a book where it's it's organized um, roughly by different categories of interest in entrepreneurship. And I have to say, out of so many books I've read about entrepreneurship, the way you divided things up here and the conversations you've had with the entrepreneurs you've spoken to, everything from the founders of Airbnb to the founders of Ben and & Jerry's and so on, everything rings so true to my own experiences in entrepreneurship. And it's a lot of unobvious things that people don't usually get. No, I really, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I wanted to structure the book um, and it's going to sound a little weird, but um, I, I actually structured it on, uh, on a, on the, on the concept of the hero's journey. So um, ah, Joseph Campbell, right. Joseph Campbell kind of codified this idea in the, in the sixties and seventies and wrote about, how essentially every story we know um, follows a similar arc and a similar pattern. And whether it's uh, stories from the Bible or it's Gilgamesh or the Odyssey or, you know, whatever it is, there's uh, roughly speaking, there's a hero. Um, the hero has a crazy idea. Um, everyone in the, in the village thinks that the hero is a little crazy. So the hero has to leave the village and goes through a series of trials, you know, um, finds a mentor, falls into an abyss, slays a dragon, um, almost um, dies herself, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what I discovered with, with the founding of businesses is that it, it follows a similar arc. You know, um, There really is a hero's journey to founding a company, a brand, um, trying to do something disruptive in the world. And so I wanted to structure the book sort of in that way, um, as, as a, a hero's journey. Basically, the, the path that, that many people will take in trying to build something new and put something new out into the world. And so that's why I, I kind of structure it like that. You know, it's so true. And I never, I've, I, I've spoken in my own podcast about the hero's journey quite a bit in, in the context of, of writing and in the context of even building a life, like a story to tell about your own life. But I never really thought about it in the context of entrepreneurship. There's one area where I'm not, Sure. So maybe we can talk this out. It's in your, I think your second chapter. And you talk about, um, you talk about in a roundabout way, the the concept of risk, how often, um, you know, you say, is it dangerous or just scary? Leave your safety zone, but do it safely. This is the chapter where I've noticed this for myself. Whenever I've taken my time, either fully committing to a business or like my very first business that I started, I stayed 18 months at my full-time job after I started building websites in the 90s, and I didn't make the jump from one to the other full time until 18 months in, because I sort of view the process of entrepreneurship as you have the idea, and then your entire job, and this is similar to investing, your entire job really is to reduce risk after that. (laughs) Like you have the idea, maybe you have some initial sales, but you gotta really make sure you reduce risk because then it's harder to do everything else you mentioned in your book. 100%. 100%. I mean, that's, and, and you're, you're um, echoing what I say in the, in the book, which is, you know, there's a myth about entrepreneurs that they jump out of airplanes without parachutes, that they are these kamikaze risk takers. And I've, I found, you know, out of the more than, than 350 entrepreneurs, some of the, you know, greatest known entrepreneurs in the world, very, very few of them are like that. I mean, the, 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 I can count on one hand the number who are insane risk takers. Most entrepreneurs mitigate risks, you know, um, a- as you did. They keep they keep their day job. Um, they spend time really refining their idea. They interrogate their idea um, carefully. They are careful with their money as they're building their business. They do have a fallback plan. It doesn't mean that they don't believe in what they're putting out into the world. It doesn't mean that Sarah Blakely didn't believe in Spanx or that Jim Cook didn't believe that, you know, craft brewed beer could be made in the United States and that he was going to successfully do it. But it, what it meant was that if it all fell apart, which it can, you know, it, it, there's a very good chance that it can, 
you have a fallback plan. You can go back to doing work as a consultant or a sales rep, or in the case of Jane Worland, who who founded Dermalogica, um, you know, doing skincare. And and that's a really important distinction because I think risk, there's always an element of risk in starting something. The risk of failure, the risk of ridicule, the risk of people telling you it sucks, the risk of, of you know, your friends saying, what are you doing? Um, that's risky, right? Um, the, the risk of putting your money on the line. But there's there are ways to take risks that don't result in catastrophe, right? Yeah, like uh... – uh, you know, you mentioned, you tell the story of Damon John early on where he's selling these wool caps and he was doing pretty good, uh, but he kept his job as a waiter at Red Lobster. He was probably the most entrepreneurial guy at that moment at Red Lobster. No question. And Sarah Blakely, you just mentioned, she was still selling fax machines after she got her first orders for Spanx. She was still selling fax machines when Oprah Winfrey featured Spanx in her, on her show. Because Sarah sent Oprah Winfrey a package of Spanx, hoping that maybe she would see it. And she was still selling fax machines at that point. I mean, I just did an interview with Nancy Twine, who founded a company called Briogio, now one of the fastest selling, growing hair care lines at Sephora and Ulta. And she kept her job as a a, low-level analyst at Goldman Sachs up until, you know, three years into, into founding the business. So... It is a very common practice. It's hard. It's not always easy to do that. And there's no question that some founders will leave a job to really dive into their business. But to a person, I have found that they don't burn bridges. They keep their options open in case they need to pull that parachute, you know, and sometimes they do. Yeah, like, you know, a a great example, which, um, you know, you, you haven't had them on your podcast, but there could be a reason for it. Google. Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they wanted to stay as grad students. They started Google. It was getting traffic. And then the first thing they tried to do was sell it to Excite for a million dollars. And finally, they took an offer. If I remember correctly, they took an offer for $750,000, but then the Excite board rejected it. <laughs> and so they had to go. Unfortunately, they, they for them, they had to go and start their little, their little tiny search engine. I mean, it's an incredible story. Um, and, uh, I'd, I'd love to actually have them on the show and uh, there's no reason why we haven't had them on. We just, no, the only reason I say there might be reasons because they're like the biggest company in the world. <laughs> so yeah, well, and, and, and their busy. story is so super inspiring. I mean, you think about, and, and, and by the way, this is how a lot of businesses start, you know, I mean, uh, an example I can think of is Lisa Price. She had a problem, which was she couldn't find any skincare products that served her needs. She's an African-American woman. She felt like. You know, most of the skincare products out there didn't didn't weren't designed for her skin, for her skin tone, and she started making it for herself. And it really, I mean, she was a producer on the Cosby Show. You know, she had a full time job in television, and she was making this stuff for herself. Eventually, her friends would, you know, found out about it and asked if they could have some, and she made it for her friends. And then eventually, start they started encouraging her to sell it at the, at the church flea market. Well, you know. Five years, six years later, that becomes Carol's daughter, which she goes on to sell to Revlon for $25 million. Um, and then this was just a little, this was like, it was like her, her equivalent of baking cookies. I mean, it was, it was her side hustle and it was never intended to be a business until it became a business. Well, this, this leads to two different chapters in, in, in your book, but the first one being chapter one, the call, um, you know, I have my own opinions on what you just said, but I'm curious, how would you describe the call for most of these entrepreneurs? I mean, you you will recognize my answer, and I think your listeners will too. And and if they don't, I hope this is helpful. But essentially, any business is a problem. You are solving a problem. You're solving either improving on something that you, you think needs to be improved, but it is essentially a product or a service that is solving a problem for you and hopefully for lots of other people. And that is more or less, you know, the beginning, middle, and end of what a business is and how most businesses begin. I mean, and the call can, can, it can come from a moment. It can come from standing in line at a coffee shop and thinking to yourself, you know, the process of this line or, you know, the service they're offering or, you know, the way this place operates, it, it's, it, it could be improved. And I bet I could do it better. You know, how many times in, in, in your life or the lives of people listening have you thought, 
this needs to be solved and I can do it. You know, and, and of course, we don't follow up on those things. Um, sometimes we do, but most of us don't. Or we'll think, you know, there needs to be a, 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 you know, a one cup coffee machine that's portable that fits in my car. You know, whatever, whatever it might be, you know. Everybody listening to this right now has experienced that at some point in their lives. And some people will want, you know, one day they'll walk into a Walmart or a Target and they will see their invention. They will see that somebody came up with their product or service, a problem that needed to be solved. And so the inspiration for an idea can come at a moment, but oftentimes it comes from being open to ideas, thinking about the things around you, keeping your eyes wide open for the problems that you encounter in your day-to-day life, which we all do all of the time. You know, just yesterday, I was thinking about the the garbage bins that I put out on the street and and how actually they're very inefficiently designed. I'm not going to go start a new garbage company, but I could, you know, I could do that. And so I think I think that's really what the call is about. It's about a moment or a series of moments or a tipping point that you reach where something you're doing might actually be really helpful or useful to people, and you decide to take the plunge. And, you know, I was thinking a lot about this as I was reading your book and the the different examples. Of course, I kept relating things back to my own entrepreneurial experiences, both my failures and successes. And I really feel like the best version of the call is when you're solving a problem you personally have. Yes. Because then it really, like you mentioned um, Lisa Price, I think um, she's solving her own problem with skincare, right? She doesn't even think, oh, I better now sell this to a billion people. I want to make a lot of money. She's really just trying to solve her problem. And when that's the initial call, you don't have to go around validating the idea. You, You remove the risk that this idea might not be good because you know if it works for you, then at the very least you solved a problem that's yeah. gonna make your life better. Yeah. And if it works for you, it's probably gonna work for everybody like you. So so any and any mistake I've made has gone contrary. Like we'll talk later about your the chapter on bootstrapping versus taking professional money initially. Every, every mistake I've ever made has when I've gone exactly opposite to what you talk about in your book. And the things I've done that have worked is when I'm making the product that I need to use. Yeah. So, and then second, the, the let's say next level of success is when I'm solving a problem that a lot of people are facing, but I still need to bring in a domain expert to validate that we're solving the problem for that person. And third, And this is where failures come in. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but it seems like this is an idea that will make a lot of money. Yeah. And if I start with that, and and I don't think there's a single example in your book that has that version of the call. It never Never works. works. It never works. That's right. It never works. And that's why there's not a single example of that in the book. Because, you know, if you start out by saying, how can I make the greatest amount of money? Of course, it works. You know, in in the grand scheme of things, there are people who who succeed that way. But... um, I have not come across an extraordinary, you know, the, the, the idea of, of an extraordinary product. Seth Godin talks about this, right? The purple cow theory that if you want to do something, do create something extraordinary. And I try to focus on that. Uh, I try to focus on those products and services on the show. And I've never come across a product or service that was started out purely as a money play. I mean, every single and almost every single example we've had on how I built this. And in this book, it starts out as a problem you have. I mean, Think about Shopify. Shopify is a huge platform for e-commerce, right? I mean, Toby Ludke, really, his dream in life was to sell snowboards and skateboards online. He He's a snowboarder. He moved to Canada. He met um, someone there, and they fell in love, and he, that that was his thing. He wanted. He's from Germany originally. He wanted to sell snowboards. But he couldn't find good off-the-shelf software to help him make a beautiful and easy to use e-commerce store back in 2005 when he launched his website. Which is really amazing when you think about it, as you point out in the book, like 
people either thought, isn't e-commerce solved already? Or they thought, ah, e-commerce is never going to be big enough. It's dead, right. Exactly. And and meanwhile, though, you did have guys like Paul Graham who started what became Yahoo Stores. Uh, but it, Yahoo, you know, became sort of a funeral ground for a lot of a their acquisitions. Yeah. And and going back to Toby, I mean, he needed to solve his own problem. He, he, he happened to be a brilliant uh, programmer and he created his own software for his own e-commerce shop. And what happened was other people who use this platform noticed that he had this really beautiful shop and uh, they, they, they asked him where he got it. You know, where, where did you get the software? And he said, well, I, I made it. And people asked him if they could use it. And, and that essentially led to him to create Shopify, which today is one of the biggest e-commerce platforms in the world. So it started out as his problem and uh, turned into a multi-billion dollar business. I mean, it's a, it, the story, it's the same story time and again with almost every product that you know, love, and use. Yeah, and, um, you know, you just made me think of uh, kind of the the Shopify of online newsletters, which is Substack. I don't know if you've seen sure. that company. Of, so, so within three minutes, someone could log on and make their own subscription newsletter, yep. which I remember literally 10 years ago, I was talking to the Wall Street Journal and they wanted me to do a newsletter for them. And I was thinking at the time, like you mentioned earlier, oh, you have these ideas, you don't follow up with them and then you see them. I was thinking there should be a platform for just creating, you know, newsletter in a box. And I started to work on it, lost interest because, you know, other things. And then now this is like a, you know, Substack. you could tell their love for the product uh, and it's going to be a, a huge company. And it's so simple. It's a, a, a no brainer idea, but it, it's really true that if you love it, and you would use it, it's probably a, a, a good idea. You know, I, but just uh, to to make a counter example though, there are some pure financial plays that can make good businesses that are just like, let's say I wanna buy a thousand laundromats, combine them and bring the whole thing public. That's a pretty standard idea where I buy all these businesses for two times cash flow, go public for 10 times cash flow and boom, I made money. So that kind of business is a little easier. But I would argue that you probably aren't just doing that purely. I mean, it, it wouldn't be enough to get you out of bed in the morning knowing that you were only buying these laundromats to consolidate them and to make a lot of money. You probably also want to create a more efficient system. You probably also want to offer a better experience for customers. You probably think that there's something broken with, with you know, the laundromat industry or the, the system. Um, that's I actually think that that's that that motivates a lot of people who even do things like that. Um, I mean, there's a company in San Francisco called based in San Francisco called Rinse um, that 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 picks up laundry and dry cleaning and and works with local dry cleaners and laundromats to get your clothes clean. Um, and they're not looking to you know to consolidate those services as a as a money play. They're looking to create more efficiencies in the system. So. Um, you know, I, I mean, a great example of this is Wayfair. The guys who started Wayfair, they couldn't care less about furniture, okay? If you ask Niraj Shah and Steve Conine, hey, were you passionate about furniture? They, they'll tell you, no, they weren't. They had no interest in furniture. What they were interested in was trying to figure out how to make it so that people who lived in Marfa, Texas and Omaha, Nebraska and, you know, Yellowknife, whatever, that's in Canada, but could get access to the same kind of furniture that people in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco had access to. And that was Wayfair. That was the, the, they were more interested in access and in, uh, and in solving a problem of how to get great quality stuff to everybody anywhere at all times. And that's really what motivated them. That was the problem they wanted to solve. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And also, I'm... Um, um... I guess I'm not paying enough respect to the the nuances of these things. Like even in my example with the laundromats, the one thing you could be super excited about is maybe some improvements on how to structure a deal of like course. this. And maybe that could be fascinating and you could say, oh, I'm gonna test it out in this domain or whatever. And, you know, but I, I also, flipping back to the original version of the call where you solve a problem for yourself, I love your, your recounting of the story of Airbnb. I mean, literally, they needed a place to stay. <laughs> and then they saw another circumstance where other people needed places to stay. They basically took this section out of Craigslist yeah. and made it a business. 
which is also an interesting way to find ideas is to decouple things like Craigslist or Kickstarter or, or Shopify or whatever. And, and they, they created this air bed and breakfast.com, which ultimately became Airbnb. Yeah. And I, I use that example in the book as, as one of many examples, um, to highlight persistence and resilience, you know, entrepreneurs are not, I don't believe that entrepreneurs are born more resilient or more persistent. I think, I think human beings, you know, we are all susceptible to wanting to give up and resilience and persistence are, are hard won. They are the product of failures and setbacks that give you more perspective over time. And with the case of Airbnb, you know, 2008, they went to 20 investors seeking funding. Um, you could have bought 10% of Airbnb in 2008 for $150,000. And not a single one of those investors bit because at the time, the response they were getting from investors was, Who, who's going to want to stay in a stranger's house? You know, this is sort of a weird concept. And, on the, and you know, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia and, and Nate, those guys didn't really have it fully figured out yet. It was still, it was still kind of um, half-baked. But what happened was, and, and this is a really important um, uh, anecdote that I tell in the story was, in the book, was that a huge failure led to an incredibly important improvement in the service that eventually would lead to Airbnb becoming what it became, getting into Y Combinator and then becoming a hugely successful brand. And that failure was a customer feedback note, a customer who tried out the service early on when, you know, there were like five people using it, who basically said, look, I didn't like the, the transactional nature of it. I handed this guy a check. It was really weird. Um, I didn't like how many clicks it took me to sign up for Airbnb. The founders took that note and, and they were able to really use that to improve the service. It was hard to read because they thought, oh my God, we suck. You know, who's going to want to invest in us? Who's going to want to believe in us? But they actually made improvements to the service that would enable them to then become a better operation and then ultimately become an incredible business. You know, and there was another part of their story, which I found fascinating, which is how personally involved they got in every aspect of the improvement. So for instance, when they saw in New York City that a lot of the photographs of potential, you know, Airbnbs were dark, they personally went and made yeah. better photographs. They brought a camera with them and they took yeah. better photos. And now that's a service that they offer for every yes. Airbnb host. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. I mean, you know, Jamie Simonoff, who who founded Ring, um, another really just brilliant entrepreneur that I've had on the show, you know, he 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 would personally install Ring doorbells when people would 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 email with customer service questions or with frustrations. He got on airplanes, flew to Seattle to do a customer install. This is before he became, you know, famous and on Shark Tank. And I mean, this was while he was running this business. He, he really believed in this product so much. He wanted people to love it as much as he did that he would do those kinds of things. And, and to, by the way, to this day, still, to, I, I actually emailed him a couple of weeks ago asking for advice on where to place my, my different parts of my ring system. And he, he spent like an hour coming up with this map and he's just, he's super nerded out about it, you know, because that's, that's what great entrepreneurs do. They love their products. They love their service. They love the thing that they're invested in and they want to share it with the world. It's important to get knowledge about money. You, you're not just going to learn it from experience because that's the fastest way to learn money. And I, I used to think it was hard to learn lessons about the market because the internet is so saturated with advice. So it took me a long time to find the resources that I use. I've been using for 20 years for my own self to learn about money, investing. But I do want to say, you know, there's this one podcast that stands out for me that I recently discovered, and it's easy to tap into just about any money subject you want to listen to and get honest, trustworthy advice to get you in the right direction for your finances, your family's wellness, your future, or even your present. Because quite frankly, all the time, it's good to have more money than less money. So the podcast is called DIY Money, DIY as in do it yourself. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere else you get your podcasts. If you have your phone by you, 
you could check it out. You can subscribe right now. They've got some great episodes. The most recent episode that I'm looking at is how to deal with finances during this COVID-19 crisis. And if you start listening now, imagine you know you're you're going to get a better relationship with money. Knowledge is power, and this podcast at 20 minutes an episode is just a fast way to learn about all the different aspects of money, whether it's about investing, retirement, budgeting, taxes, whatever. The hosts, Daniel and Quint, they just take a fun and entertaining and playful approach to this stuff, to money, to finance. They know what they're talking about. I've I've known Quint for a decade. And I trust him and I trust his financial advice. DIY Money takes listener questions on topics from budgeting to tracking expenses to investing to retirement plans. And they do it, importantly, without putting you to sleep. So do yourself a favor. Check out the DIY Money podcast wherever you get your podcast. This is more important than ever now that we're in this kind of crisis because of the coronavirus. Stay up to date with good, talented, smart people. Podcasts like this are the best resource for financial information DIY money. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy 
from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You know, how many, a, a lot of the, um, I'm going to skip all around the topics of your book. Sure. Because uh, each thing makes me think of something. But uh, how many of the entrepreneurs that you think you've interviewed are were the CEOs for a long time after the company started? You know, Sarah Blakely being a great example, Damon John, uh, obviously the Google guys, yeah. and Mark Zuckerberg. But often founders are relegated to the side also I do think the founder CEOs are very successful in, it's hard to, I don't know the statistics on it, so it's hard to say, but I find the most exciting stories are the ones where the founders become CEOs and, and really build the company. Yeah, I mean, um, Gary Erickson of Cliff Bar, founder CEO, you know, Nancy Twine of Briogeo, founders, Jamie Siminoff of Ring, founder CEO, Kathy Hughes, who founded Urban One, the largest network of black owned um, um, radio stations in the country, founder, former CEO, her son is now the CEO. Um, so this is a common story. I think there was a time, and you know this, James, when investors and, and you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, investors would encourage founders to step aside. You know, this was the, um, you know, this is the, the classic examples, Eric Schmidt, right? Eric Schmidt becomes Google CEO because there was a time when investors thought, you know, professional, professional managers are better, um, uh, you know, are, are, are sort of more adept at running companies and businesses. And founders are visionaries and dreamers. And and there, I don't think that's entirely false. I think there's a little bit of truth to that. And of course, it's it's founder, um, you know, specific. But I think in in the last ten years, the pendulum has really swung back to basically where where investors and backers have essentially said to founders, look. This is your company. You need to lead it. And if you need help and guidance, we will help you and guide you. I mean, Toby Ludke, the, the founder of Shopify, was not keen on being the CEO. He was looking for a CEO. But his investor said, Toby, you, you know, you've got to rise to this occasion. This is your company and you understand it better than anyone else. And you have to find the charisma within you to lead an organization. And he, he you know, he, he admits, he admitted to me on the show, and, and we talk about this a little bit in the book, is that it took him time. It was not, it wasn't easy to do. But I think that, you know, there's a real argument for founders to, to, to maintain leadership in their businesses because they know the story better than anybody else. And they know the culture and the mission that they want to create and the idea that they wanted to put out into the world. They know intimately and very nuanced the problem they're solving and why this solution works for them. Yes, exactly. So like the Airbnb guys, they're not just trying to structure business deals. They saw, oh, these fo photographs are dark. That's a problem. We're going to fly over there. And not only that, 
we're going to now then make this a service in general for the company. Yeah. Whereas like a CEO, like a like someone out of a CEO background who was headhunted and, and so on, might not have that sense of nuance with the product. And even if approached about it, because it's such a weird offshoot of the original idea, uh, uh, he might say, no, look, let's stay focused and just get into more markets and this will slow us down. Joe Gebbia, Brian Chesky, they, they knew, no, 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 we got to make sure these photographs look good. Yeah. And they're the keepers of the culture. You know, they know why the business matters um, and, and why it's important. I mean, look, it's why Pat Brown is the founder of Impossible Foods and the CEO of Impossible Foods. Impossible Foods is one of the most revolutionary businesses, I think, out there. He's trying to he's trying to create meat. He is. He's creating meat out of plants. You know, he believes that we can eventually engineer all of our meat from plants, from the 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 soy hemoglobin, um, the the leg hemoglobin protein that you find in soy. Um, he's running that company. Is he the greatest manager on earth? No, I think he'd admit that he's not. But he's a pre, but he's a he's pretty good at it. He's you know, and and he can also he you know, he can also fully articulate why they exist, why they're out there in the world, um, and and that business, that company is. It's his. It's 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 Pat Brown's company. I will say though, at the same time, it's super important for founders to to remember in the back of their minds that they have to build a culture and not a cult. You know, you don't you, you want to build something that you believe in that you feel strongly about, but you also want to build something that you can walk away from down the road that is so strong that's bigger than you. You know, you, you Brian Chesky founded Airbnb, but down the road, he's going to walk away and there's going to be a new CEO. And that company has to be so strong and resilient that it can thrive with a new leader at the helm too. Because if it's only about you, um, then the company also dies with you, which you don't want, right? You want to you build something enduring with a long, long lasting legacy. You know, that that's really true. Like one time I had a business, it was a, it was a financial sort of business, it was a, it was a fund of hedge funds. Yeah. So people would give me money and I would invest in a variety of hedge funds. And we got an offer to sell, uh, we, or to sell our company from a major bank. And then we were like, oh, this is great. Let's take it. So we take, we say yes. And they send us the deal. The deal was all fine. Except at one point they wanted me to sign a six year employment agreement. And if at any time I left, we all had to give all the money back. <laughs> And so I realized, damn, I spent years building this business and the only equity value is me. And so we, we actually immediately shut down the business and started a new one, which then successfully sold. But uh, uh, it's, it's really true. There's one chapter uh, that really intrigued me and I, it, I, it really resonated. And I think it's also unobvious to people. The idea of hitting something through the side door. Yeah. Maybe explain that a little bit because this is this is like a key to entrepreneurship that most people don't think about. Yeah, it's, a, it's such an important um, it's such an important way to think about how to get your product or idea out into the world, and I, and it actually really resonates with me too as a podcaster because for most of my career I was a news reporter and then I was a news anchor, and that's a very you know it's a very crowded field, um, and to distinguish yourself in that field was very hard. You know, I was good at what I did. And I was a, a host on a major national news magazine radio program. But, uh, you know, I, it was never going to be my thing. And I really made a pivot into podcasting early in 2012, when it was still kind of the Wild West and, and sort of this weird niche thing. But that pivot was my side door entry into, um, you know, into, into, into doing what I do now, and into finding a completely new audience. The example I talk about, one of the examples I talk about in the book is the story of RX bars. Mm. Um, you know, if you go to Whole Foods today or any grocery store and you look at the energy bar aisle, there are like five, six, seven, eight hundred different energy bars. There's probably a thousand different energy bars in the United States today. It's a, an incredibly crowded field, marketplace, just like cosmetics. So how do you differentiate what you do? It's a little bit like podcasting, by the way. There are a million podcasts. How do you differentiate it? It's very hard. I mean, digital marketing, is social networking, it's not so easy. So the story I tell, um, and I won't give all of it away, is, is about RX Bar. 
And RX Bar basically came on to the scene at a time when there were a thousand energy bars out there, but they didn't go to Whole Foods. They didn't go to Trader Joe's right away. They didn't go to the grocery chains. They went to CrossFit gyms because nobody was serving that community. Nobody was making a, an energy bar that was paleo. You know, a lot of CrossFitters eat a paleo diet. They don't want, um, uh, you know, refined oils. They don't want sugar. They don't want grains. They don't want legumes. They don't want beans. So Peter Rahal makes an energy bar from eggs and dates and nuts which CrossFitters can eat um, if they're paleo. That's how he really builds this brand up. You know, eventually CrossFitters are talking about it. There's buzz, it's a direct to consumer model. And then Trader Joe's and other people start to come to Peter and say, hey, we wanna sell this bar. So he really went in through the side door by going to these individual CrossFit gyms instead of going directly to the big players and trying to make a pitch. That, that's interesting because it makes you think like, oh, if you write a book, maybe a great place to put the book is not in the airport bookstore where everybody wants to go and not on the front table of Barnes and Noble, but in the FedEx Kinko's stores where they sell like six books around a little carousel. And those books are usually bestsellers. Exactly. Exactly. So how do you think you uh, did that with your podcast? You know, part of it was, um, part of it was, uh, of course, we were in early, you know, I, it was just a, an early pivot to to a, a part of the the media um, that wasn't fully developed. And part of it was, I think, um, just kind of, you know, appealing to a different uh, type of audience. I mean, what's, what's interesting about how I built this, this is very, very un unusual, I think, for a business show is that um, the majority of our listeners are actually women. So I'm, um, I'm, as you can probably tell- You're a very I'm, attractive guy, so maybe- uh, uh, No, what... no, no. Uh, most people don't know what I look like. As you can tell, I'm a male and I'm a male host, but I really do, I'm, I'm very conscious and have been conscious since day one that the show is not just male entrepreneurs, that it's a show that, that highlights, showcases, and celebrates entrepreneurs of all backgrounds, genders, and really showcases a diverse group of founders. And- we early on noticed that women were listening to the show, you know, and I think part of that had to do with the fact that we started our we started our, our show four years ago with Sarah Blakely. She was our first guest. We very intentionally did that. We focused on Spanx, um, even though, you know, lots of people listening didn't know what Spanx were. Um, and our, our strategy has been to make every episode hopefully interesting to anyone, even if they're not interested in that product or brand, but to make the story so interesting that they're and the lessons so interesting that they're going to want to listen to it. And I think that was our side door by kind of, you know, going to an underserved market. There aren't a whole lot of business shows. Now there are more, but there really weren't a whole lot of business shows that felt kind of gender neutral. A lot of them were, you know, focused on stocks and, and you know, and, and quick news and, and the latest, you know, strategy and, and, and Q2 reports and so on and so forth. And we really wanted to do a show that was, um, a narrative, a business show that was a narrative. Yeah, and I, I would say also a lot of business shows that focus on entrepreneurs either get, they, I think you hit a sweet spot in the middle where one end of the spectrum is, tell me your whole life story. Like, you know, did your mom do this to you? Did the school school kids make fun of you? Blah, blah, blah. And then it takes them all the way through their life. So the the business itself, you know, is just only a part of that story. And then the other type of entrepreneur related podcast as compared to yours, I think gets too much into the nuts and bolts of the, the business. Like, oh, you're in a sales business. How can I be a better salesperson right. type of thing? Or yeah, or like, how do, I, how do I do this to make this kind of money or stuff like that? Yeah, I agree. And, and, and not that there's anything wrong there with isn't. either of those. There isn't, but, no. But like what you do do is like take that RX bar as an example. I have no, I've never eaten a protein bar in my life, but there, that, that idea of going through the side door has so many applications and just it opens up a vast portal to ideas that are parallel to what they, like for instance, you also talk about the five hour uh, energy drinks, yep. which again, I've never had one in my life. But it was like the lights turned on when I read that section in the book because they did something similar in, in a weird parallel yep. way to the RX bar. And it was fascinating. And there's so many lessons to be learned from that for anyone looking to start a business or, or wants to be inspired by those who do or really anyone looking to, to create something disruptive because I, I very intentionally want how I built this, the show and this book, 
not to be only for people who want to start their own enterprise. I want it to be for people who want to start anything, any idea, even if it's inside of a business or a company where they already work. Because as you know, introducing anything into the world, whether it's a new product or a service or a new way of working in your own company is going to create friction. It's disruptive. People aren't going to like it. And so the idea behind the show and the book is to say that is a prerequisite to creating something meaningful. Friction, disruption, resistance, like all of these things you will encounter, you have no choice. So get ready, steal yourself, and understand that, that that's a good sign. And, and all of the lessons that I'm bringing you from people who've been through it will essentially say to you, keep at it. You got this. There's no way around it. There are no shortcuts. The only shortcut in creating a business or a new idea or a new vision or something is to learn from people who've tried the same thing and to learn from their mistakes so you don't avoid them. But other than that, there are no shortcuts. You know, it's interesting about the pain aspect and the fact that people will tell you, you know, you can't, you can't do that. What are you doing? You've, Sarah, you've never made a clothing line before. And I, I, or, you know, yeah, Brian and Joe, you've never made a hospitality business before no. you're sleeping on your yeah. friend's couch. Uh, and I think a lot of, um, people who built X are people who had never built X before also. And so what, what do you think about that? Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like Sarah Blakely was this coming out of the fashion industry no. and doing a small tweak to pantyhose. She was solving a major problem. And, and I think because she wasn't in the fashion industry, she was able to look at it in a completely out of the box or not even working in the same box way. A, a thousand percent. Do you know how many entrepreneurs have told me that? They've, they, they've said to me, you know, my advantage in this industry was because I didn't have any experience. I was so naive. Tyler Haney, who founded Outdoor Voices, she's no longer with the company, but it's a very successful brand of leisure wear, athleisure wear. She had no experience. You know, she, she, she had to beg and plead with um, textile makers and, and, and even she went to seamstresses just to see what they did. She spent, you know, a year and a half researching the product. The founders of Away, you know, Jen Rubio, Steph Corey, they had no experience in luggage. They had no experience in it. Um, but they they spent a lot of time really researching that that industry and learning about it. And and the fact that they were so naive about it actually gave them a huge leg up because, you know, had they understood the obstacles to making a suitcase and manufacturing it and shipping it to the U.S., they may not have gotten into it, you know, in the first place. So I think that in, in many, many cases, there's an enormous advantage to not actually having a whole lot of experience. But what it is crucial and important, I talk about this in a book and with, with many examples, that you do your research, that you do your research, that, that again, there are no shortcuts. You have to do your research. Right. And um, I, I love that chapter because it's an underlooked part of entrepreneurship, but I, I liken it to um, prediction markets, actually. Hmm. So have you ever played with a prediction market where you can bet on elections or political events? I know, but yeah, but I haven't because I'm not as risky as you are, but yeah, or smart, but yes, I know about them. No, no, I, I doubt that. But, uh, what I found is, is that placing even tiny bets on, you know, world outcomes, political outcomes, you know, the concept of skin in the game, I suddenly want to become the expert, like, so that my bet is bulletproof. Like I made a bet last year on, um, and it seems like a thousand years ago now, but I made a bet on Brexit. And, and at that point I thought I knew about Brexit, but at that point I immersed myself so deep in every law in the EU huh. and in England and all the problems that I became like literally to the point where I could write articles wow. about Brexit <laughs> and you, but that's the case with, with everything. So totally like I, um, you know, there's, there's one uh, field of expertise that I have where I, I'm building a software product. And I thought, okay, I already know what I want. I already know what's out there. Uh, I'm an expert in the field. But once I started, I, it's like a three levels deeper level of immersion. Oh, there's these other software products. They, they have these uh, 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 features that maybe I could borrow. Or then I have to say, well, why isn't anyone else 
building this software product. And then you start looking in the resumes of all the software engineers working for those companies uh, that are competitive. And you start to see what, you know, what's in common with the good programmers, what's in common with the not so good programmers. And, and the, the level of expertise you build from research because you now have skin in the game is is just immense uh, and changes the product. 100%. You know, I did a, an episode of the show recently about a company called The Laundress. And The Laundress is a brand of natural, non-toxic um, household cleaning products. Started by Lin, uh, uh, two friends. Um, one of them was Lindsey Boyd. They met at Cornell and... Um, you know, they worked in the fashion industry for a couple of years, but they really wanted to make a, a, a you know, they wanted to make a, a product where you could, you'd be able to dry clean your clothes at home. And they went back up to Cornell and met with a professor there who was an expert in, uh, in detergents, in household cleaners. And they basically stayed there for a month and just interrogated this professor and spent time in, in uh, the, the, the chemistry library um, and then spent like another year and a half really understanding the chemistry of of the products they wanted to build. They had mm. no background in it, but eventually they built it and you know it went on to sell the laundress for you know I don't know, I think I think close to a hundred million dollars. So it's just an amazing story. Um, and and it, you see this time and again. I mean John Foley who started Peloton, he didn't know anything about the the fitness industry. He was working in he worked for T Ticketmaster. You know he worked he he knew about he was a, a tech executive, but, but, you know, he didn't know about, you know, how to build a, an exercise bike or, or, or a fit or how to create a fitness company. He spent a lot of time researching it. So it's, it's key. It's absolutely crucial. You have to do the work. Um, but as I say, in many, many cases, there's an advantage in not, in not knowing what you don't know at the beginning. Right. And, and it it is worth pointing out that this is not a requirement to not know anything like, uh, you know, one company I was very familiar with, Ticketfly, the founder and CEO, Andrew Dreskin, came from Ticketmaster where he had previously sold a tickets company. So he basically rebuilt his old company that he had sold to Ticketmaster, yeah. but added social media features. So that became his unique advantage. So he knew the space and he hired all, I mean, he, he brought on all his old customers and had a good head start. So sometimes it helps, but it's often you get this, this, really out, uh, having this really outside view allows you to be much more creative Yeah, because not, nothing is off the table is basically and, it. And at the same time, sometimes having an insider view like your friend gives you this incredible advantage too. I mean, I can think of like, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs I've had on the show, they, they did exactly what you're describing. They, they were working in an industry and they saw that there was an, that there needed to be an improvement or they had an expertise, some kind of expertise in something that they felt wasn't fully accessible. I mean, the, a great example of this is Headspace. Okay. The Headspace app, you are probably familiar with it. It's a wonderful meditation app. I mean, Andy Puttycomb was a monk. He spent nine years of his life training to be a Buddhist monk. He lived in Myanmar. He was at a, at a monastery in Russia, one in Scotland, in the south of England. He was all over the world, in China and India. But, you know, after nine years, he comes back to London and starts just to teach meditation to, to people who are stressed out and comes to realize that, you know, these incredibly beautiful tenets of Buddhism um, were, were not always accessible to everybody. And he figured out a way to make them accessible. And that was really the, the the foundation of what became Headspace, which is an incredibly successful brand and company. Yeah, you know, and um, uh, again, use it making something that is useful to you, whether or not you even intended to sell to someone else, or in this case, you did intend. He he did intend to sell it to other people, but it's still using a decade of his experience. Reminds me also, like the Shopify example, reminds me of Derek Sivers. Uh, who, who created CD Baby in the 90s. Yep. He just wanted to make a platform to sell his own CDs. And then all, like like with the Shopify guys, everybody said, hey, how did you do that? And so he created CD Baby just by accident because it was such a good product yeah. for himself. So it, it's an important thing. And then, um, you know, you also talk about iterating and pivoting and... Again, I always think of examples from my own experiences, but I was invested in this one company once, uh, Buddy Media, started by this guy, Mike Lazarow. And 
I was so amazed at how well he pivoted. This is a company started in 2007 to make Facebook games like mm -hmm. Zynga. And then he saw the financial crisis coming. He pivoted to be like a Facebook ad agency. Huh. So if you're Pepsi Cola, he would say, hey, we'll create a Facebook presence for you. There's uh, 50 million users, 100 million users, a billion users. You need a presence here. And so he pivoted to that because a service business is a profitable business even during hard times. And then he pivoted again when he, had, he was developing so many of the same services for so many companies, he made it a software as a service type company and then ended up selling for like 800 million to Salesforce. Wow. And it was like just masterful pivots each time. Each time, yeah. And I love stories of pivots. You know, we, we, um, we really try to focus on those because it's often the case that the first business you first business idea you have is not fully refined, and that's okay. It, it, you shouldn't ha you shouldn't wait until it's fully refined because it's not going to be fully refined until it's it's it, you know it, it, you 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 have a chance to test it with consumers and other people. Um, and you know, and a good example of this is ClassPass. I mean, ClassPass started out as as a, as a service that enabled you to take any class you wanted in. New York, photography, painting, art, cooking, not exercise, you know, and, and, and it was an, it was started out as an a la carte option. And then they had a then, then they pivoted to a completely different model where it was uh, one one pass for all these classes. Then they dropped the other classes and they went to exercise and then they pivoted to a completely different model. Again, they went to five or six different models to where today they're they're completely different, you know, essentially a different brand, you know, you, you get credits basically to go to exercise classes. That is a great example of how a business changes, pivots and iterates over time. Um, and you see this again and again. I, I mean, ZocDoc is another good example of a business that started out, you know, where they, um, you know, they wanted to connect, you know, patients with doctors. And at first you, it was, you know, every, every person who, you know, every time they, they, you made an appointment with a doctor, they would get a small fee and then they changed it to a, a high a yearly subscription for the doctors. And then they changed it to a lower subscription. Now it, now the way the service works is that, um, every time a new patient is onboarded by a doctor, the doctor pays a fee to ZocDoc and that's essentially the business model. So business models change and also companies pivot, you know, their companies like Slack started out as a gaming business. It started out as a massive multiplayer online game and pivoted entirely to what it is today. So, you know, it happens. It happens when when all of a sudden you see the, the product that you've been ignoring is right in front of you. That's the thing that people want, not the not the thing that you may have started out with. Right, and and um, I forget what the original name of Twitter was, but it was podcasting software. Yeah. Ed Williams wanted to start a podcasting business in like 2004, and obviously they pivoted. This guy in the corner, Jack Dorsey, was working on this Twitter thing. Yeah. Exactly. And, and Instagram, I forgot what Bourbon did. It's a check-in uh, app. It was a check-in app. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could check in and say, hey, I'm here at uh, Starbucks or wherever you were. But, and, and nobody really, wasn't that, you know, people weren't really into it. Um, but people were into the photos part of it, the photo sharing part of it. And the filters, yeah. that's what people liked. And that became the product. And then, um, I don't know if you know this story, because it's, it's, it's not quite a pivot, but like a split off. But if I'm telling the story correctly, Genie, which is the, you know, ancestry, you know, dot com lookalike type company, and then Yammer. They so within Genie, they were using internally built software to almost like a Slack internally to you know share details of the projects and talk to each other. And then they sold Yammer for like a billion dollars to Microsoft. That 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 software internally they built, they spun it out as a separate company. It, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, and it happens again and again. I love these stories because it it proves that that really resilience is is the key here, right? Because you may come up with a cool idea that you love that isn't quite right. It's not quite right, but from that idea, something better will emerge. You know, what about um, I, this is related to your chapter on iterate, and I think this is a really important concept. Uh, I was talking to Jim McKelvey, who's the founder of Square mm -hmm. or co-founder with Jack Dorsey. And he, he basically every problem they encountered along the way, they had to not pivot, but kind of iterate like, you know, I forgot exactly what he called it, um, like an entrepreneurial stack where he had to basically build one thing on top of another to 
solve these problems and ultimately create a better, more robust company as a result. And you see this time and again, not only in tech companies. And by the way, most of what we focus on in the book is not tech. It's not technology. We focus on ordinary consumer brands, you know, Tate's Cookies and Stacy's Pita Chips and Stonyfield Yogurt. And Stonyfield Yogurt is an example of that. I mean, they, they ran into... And, and the Stacy's Pita Chips. Yeah, right? I mean, they ran into problem after problem after problem with Stonyfield. It took them nine or 10 years before they were profitable. They were hemorrhaging money. Apparently, it's 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 it costs a lot of money to make yogurt, and the the margins aren't that great. But it, it took them a while before they became one of the biggest selling yogurt brands in the U.S. You know, they ran into so many problems. You know, the cows weren't producing enough milk, or the machinery would break, or the distributors wouldn't show up, or you know, the 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 the, the landowner would would demand higher rent, and and they had to, or somebody was trying to take away their you know. Their, their production facility again and again and again, problem after problem after problem. And, you know, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is as a guide for people when they encounter problems, because you will encounter every single problem under the sun starting a business. And, and the idea behind this book really was, was in a sense to be kind of like a yellow pages of problems and how they were solved. Mm. Yeah. And I guess, again, that's why the concept of a big job for the entrepreneur is is mitigating risk is so important because A, it helps you avoid a lot of problems before they occur. B, if you do have problems, there's a tool chest, whether it's some money in the bank, some big customers, your job that you have on the side or full time, there's some way to deal with the, with the problems without it putting you out of business. And, and so the concept of risk is really important because otherwise it seems like if I take that component out, you're telling me, oh my God, I, I got the call, but it still might not be yeah. the final product. And I have a product which seems great, but I might have to switch the entire business model three times. And then I'm gonna have all these problems again, but I'm gonna have to iterate solutions and, and solve them. And uh, on and on and on. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna bootstrap, but at some point I'm gonna run out of money. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of difficulties, but, but you know, risk is important and having that call where, you know, you don't quite refer to it as validating the idea, but having some way to say, this is a good idea. I know it because I use it. Yep. I know it because a lot of other people are yep. already using it is, is important. Yep. I agree. I agree a thousand percent. And then and the side door is also important because you could be like five hour energy could have been a me too, uh, power drink, you know, energy drink. And instead they found a way to be a monopoly. Exactly you know, kind of in that zero to one Peter Thiel sense. Exactly. Exactly. They built a moat around their product. And today I think they com completely dominate the energy drink market. And I, I explain how they did that in the book um, in a very creative way. And I think it's it's a great example of a company that, that you know, that built a moat around its business um, by thinking creatively and going through the side door. You know, if you think about it, like, I'm just trying to think like you're, you're in podcasting. Again, I'm trying to think of like, what's, What's a side door? It could be taking every episode and making it a mini book. And now that we've been talking about, you know, alternative ways of distributing stuff, you know, you put all these mini books in hotel rooms or in airplanes or whatever. Uh, so it makes you, it opens up all this it does. Uh, realm of creativity. Yeah. And I, I also, I think that the side door when it comes to things like podcasting is to look in a completely different place or to try a completely different thing, you know? A lot of people ask me how how they can scale their podcasts because there are a million podcasts in the English language, and and maybe maybe two or three thousand of those podcasts have more than five thousand downloads a week, right? The vast majority of podcasts are like uh, are like enterprises in America. It's a, a single person. It's like a it's like an Etsy store. It's one person running it, right? And a couple people using it. And the reality is it's not that easy to do it. It's like, how do you get a million Twitter followers instantly or, or any, any type of social media action? And, and what I think is it's always important um, to look beyond the obvious, you know? So for me, it was going from radio to podcasting. And eventually there's going to be some other cool thing that's going to be out there. You know, that's the sort of the side door approach, which is to kind of keep your eyes open for a different entry point into finding an audience. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've noticed recently on the podcast, you've been really focused on resilience. Yep. What, um, what got you to focus on that? Like, what were you thinking about? 
what was a pandemic. I mean, we we um, you know, we do we still do our regular episodes once a week where I, I do a deep dive on one company, and one brand. But once the pandemic hit, it became clear that our our audience, uh, who are made up of entrepreneurs, really wanted a place to gather, a community, you know, sort of a gathering spot to hear how other people are dealing with the crisis because we knew this was going to be big. And we scrambled, and, and very, very quickly, we went to three episodes a week. So the two, the, the, the two resilience episodes we do a week are shorter. Um, they're live. They're quicker. But they're really interesting. We've heard from Brian Chesky and from, you know, the founder and from Stuart, Stuart Butterfield of, of Slack. We've had people, Jen Hyman of Rent the Runway, you know, people who've been on the show who've come back on to say, hey, you know, this is how we're dealing with this crisis. Um, it's been really hard. And this is this is these are some of the decisions we made um, to build resilience. And the idea behind it is to give people listening um, ideas um, and also reassurance for how they can also build resilience during this very challenging time. Yeah, you know it's interesting. Like uh, when the pandemic started, I upped my number of podcasts per week, and I became topical for the first time in six years because this was what people needed yes. more than anything was to understand the various angles and information of what was happening there. And the media wasn't really doing a holistic view of that. And so, uh, you know, I thought, I thought that was, that was my pivot during the, the pandemic. But, um, you know, there was, I, I also was really interested in the chapter about getting the word out, getting the buzz out yep. about one specific thing, which is the idea of not quite insulting your customer, but driving your customer away. So like, for instance, the, the five guys burgers, they would have a sign that said, if you, if you don't like this, there's, there's a lot of other good burger stores around here. Yeah. Like, I love that because there's a certain authenticity yeah. to it. There probably were a lot of burger stores around there. And it reminds me actually of Google in a weird way. So Google, when you go to Google and you say, tell me about motorcycles, Google says, we don't know anything about motorcycles, but here's 10 other websites you can go to. Yep. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. And so you always go back to Google. So it's not quite the same thing, but I, I, I like the idea of being a little bit harsh with your customers, not in a bad way, yeah. like in a loving way, but still like brutal. Yeah. I mean, in, in the case of five guys, it's a great example because it, it, you know, essentially what they're signaling there is, look, if you want a great burger, it's going to take a little longer, you know? If you don't want to wait, there are a bunch of great burger joints around here, and that's fine. No harm, no foul. You know, and I love that. What other examples like that can you think of? Um, you know, I think that, um, I mean, Southwest Airlines is a great example. You know, Southwest Airlines, mm, Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they were sort of unapologetic about how they operated. It's like, you know, you line up, you get a number, um, there's no seats, we're going to be really nice. And, but we're, we're like, this is what you get. Uh, you're not going to get a fancy chair. You're not going to get, there's no first class. There's no extra leg room, uh, but it's a good safe flight and the price is right. And they were pioneers. Yeah. And I guess uh, another one is like the car, who was the car rental company? That's like, we're number two was their slogan. <laughs> is that Avis or Hertz? Yeah, I don't remember, but that's a great slogan. Yeah. Because it's basically is just being honest. Yeah. Like if you could kind of, it's it's so hard to do marketing, and I don't want to say it's hard to do marketing and be honest, but it's hard to do marketing and feel honest. Yeah. And when when you are self deprecating in some way, that is strong. Anyway, guy, there's so mu many good things in this book. How I built this. There's so many great things going on in your your podcast. Like each one of your episodes, there's there's so many lessons. We didn't really talk about bootstrapping and other people's money, but I will say- Well, you could buy the book. Yeah, and I, and I will say it does feel great <laughs> to, to bootstrap yeah. because then you don't have to listen to anybody for a good That's long true. time. <laughs> and, and, I, and I talk about how to do that in the book and there's so much more. Um, and I, hope, I do hope people um, who are interested in entrepreneurship or interested in starting their own thing or who just want to be inspired, the book is, is designed to inspire um, we'll take a look and, and hopefully pick the book up and, and I hope it's helpful. Yeah. We only touched on like 1% of the stories in this book. There are so many amazing stories and, and lessons. So how I built this by Guy Raz. Also his podcast is called surprisingly how I built this <laughs> and he's, he's holding up a picture of it, but we'll have a picture available as well. And 
buy it in stores everywhere, which basically just means Amazon right now. <laughs> and thank you so much, Guy, you, for, for coming on the podcast. Thanks. I've long been a fan. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for your questions. Did you know that franchise owners are more likely to start a successful business than entrepreneurs who go it alone? Neighborly offers 19 premier brands with services that repair, maintain, and enhance homes. With Neighborly, you'll get the business model, marketing resources, and corporate support you need to pursue a rewarding future. Learn more about joining over 5,000 Neighborly franchises by downloading your free guide at go.nbly.com podcast.